everyone. Uh, welcome. Recording in progress, but welcome, uh, welcome to tonight's uh, meeting of the California Book Club. I'm David L. Ulin, the books editor of Alta Journal. Um, and before we get started, I want to introduce the book club, Alta Journal, um, tell you a little bit about uh, the event. We're really excited tonight to have Jaime Hernandez with us um, talking about Maggie the Mechanic. Unfortunately, John Freeman is not able to moderate tonight's conversation, um, but Oscar Villa, Oscar Villalone, my good friend and um, our uh, associate is filling in and our special guest will be California Book Club editor, Anita Felicelli. California Book Club is a monthly um, meeting and discussion of books uh, that are part of what we consider to be the new California canon. Um, the the uh, book club is dedicated to the notion that um, the most interesting and exciting literature um, in the country is being produced in this state. Um, we all believe that to be true, and we are um, happy to present these works to all of you and have these conversations. Um, every month, the California, and we do this, I'm sorry, in conjunction uh, with, our, with our partners who I want to acknowledge. Those partners are Book Passage, Book Soup, Books Inc., Bookshop, Bookshop West Portal, Diesel, a bookstore, Green Apple Books, the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West, the Los Angeles Public Library, the San Francisco Public Library, Narrative Magazine, Romans Bookstore, and Ziziva, uh, where Oscar is managing editor. Um, I'd like to, you know, let you remind you, California Book Club's monthly events and continuous content leading up to each club meeting are always free. If you haven't had a chance to um, to check it all out, you'll definitely want to. A uh, great sort of supplement to the conversation you're about to see. The, there are essays from many contributors with reflections uh, on and related to tonight's work. There's an, act, an excerpt of Maggie the Mechanic and more. All of this is also included in our weekly California Book Club newsletter, which is also free. So please sign up um, and you'll be getting you'll get the information in, in your inbox. Um, so how can you support the work we do, bringing these in-depth articles, essays, and interviews uh, with, with writers and artists like Jaime Hernandez to you? We do have a sale for California Book Club members. For just $50, you'll get a year of Alta Journal. You'll get the California Book Club hat and one of our upcoming California Book Clubs, uh, one of our upcoming California Book Club books. Just go to altaonline.com slash join or watch tomorrow's thank you email for a link to this great deal. You can also join Alta as a digital member for just $3 a month, which will give you access to all of the California Book Club uh, material, as well as the um, online book reviews and the other online web only uh, material that we're publishing at Alta Online. Um, and for Bay Area people, please join us tomorrow night. We'll be hosting a live in-person party at Bookshop West Portal at 7 p.m. to raise a glass and celebrate our new desert issue, our desert print issue, the most recent print issue of the magazine. The event is free. There'll be some readings from uh, author contributors and everyone is welcome. Again, for Bookshop West Portal tomorrow night, January 20th at 7 o'clock. Uh, and now, enough of me, let me introduce my friend Oscar um, to take us away. Oscar. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you, David, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out uh, for, this, uh, for this event. Let me introduce our author for the evening. It's Jaime Hernandez. He's recognized as one of the greatest comic book artists working today in 2017. He and his brother Gilbert, with whom he started the series Love and Rockets, which we'll talk about very soon, were inducted in the Will Eisner Comic Book Hall of Fame. In 2016, he received the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for his graphic novel, The Love Bunglers, and in 2018, received the Aesop Book Prize for his children's book, The Dragon Slayer Folktales from Latin America. His work has also appeared in The New Yorker, New York Times Magazine, and Hernandez has also created DVD covers for the Criterion Collection and album covers for bands such as Los Lobos and the Indigo Girls. Love and Rockets was started in 1981 by Jaime and his brothers Gilbert and Mario, and will continue off and on for decades. The book club selection, Maggie and the Mechanic, is but a slice of that immense and landmark body of work. In this volume, the Rockets part of Love and Rockets is made clear, and we are introduced to Maggie and Hopi, two of the most iconic characters in the history of American comics. The work collected here is made up of both the intimate and the incredible taking place not just on the sidewalks of Oxnard, California, but in fantastical jungles in imaginary countries on the other side of the globe. 
There are dinosaurs and cholos, superheroes and pro wrestlers, the lovelorn and the locas, the powerful and the punks. It is also a Chicano universe that seemingly contains all the wonder the world could possibly hold. With that, would you please give a warm welcome to the California Book Club to Jaime Hernandez. Hello. Hello, Jaime, how are you doing? I'm, uh, I'm wonderful, thank you. Thank you, glad to be here. Uh, Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you for being here. I wanted to start off by asking you, when you and your brothers put out that first issue of Love and Rockets in 1981, did you have a sense of the deep richness of characters and stories you were about to unlock? Um, I know I liked writing them. You know, I didn't, I didn't know, uh, we hadn't had any feedback, you know, but we kind of trusted ourselves that, um, that, that we, let's put it this way. We were having fun <laughs> doing it and that's all <laughs> that mattered, you know. Um, it was just something I found that I enjoyed doing. That's why the, as the comic took off, I just, uh, the characters was all I cared, cared about after a while, you know. Right. Um, I, I wanted to talk more about those characters, particularly Maggie and Hopi, but I, I just want to set a little uh, context for us before uh, we get further in. Um, uh, you grew up in Oxnard, uh, yes. which is uh, in Ventura County. I happen to know it uh, as the hometown of boxer Fernando Vargas, and where, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, La Colonia Boxing Gym is down there. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us what Oxnard was like when you were a kid, and I only ask this too because Oxnard does show up in Love and Rockets. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, I kind of base my fake, my fictional Southern California town of Huerta uh, based on Oxnard, basically. Um, it was uh, what you see in the comic. It was it was just a small uh, agricultural town, you know, a lot of a lot of farm workers and um, and all that. Uh, we also had uh, the beach where the rich people had their summer houses, mm. you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but um, to me, it was just normal, just neighborhood stuff, you know, suburb stuff, uh, growing up in um, kind of diverse neighborhood, you know, mostly Mexican. But uh, I don't know how to explain it other than it was just, it was home, you know, and it was, uh, and it, it was, uh, it was a great experience growing up. That's why I tell all these stories because I like to uh, to to kind of include my little part of the world into the world, you know. And so, and so growing up in Oxnard, um, let me expand upon that a little bit. Um, how did these sort of stories around you? How did they sort of bubble up and and and, and make their way into into the series? Oh, well, um, you know, grew up reading comics and then drawing comics for mm -hmm. ourselves. And, uh, you know, and it was something that I clicked with. You know, I liked drawing and then I started to learn to write. Right as the comic was starting, I was, it was a real learning experience for me. And, um, and how old are you when you're, when you're first doing this? When you're first uh, uh, trying your hand at comics? Oh, well, you know, five years old, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, I was drawing my Batman comics or my, you know, or right. making up my own little superheroes or my, my funny peanuts like characters, um, just kind of um, taking from the comics I read, you know, I read the superhero comics, I read the Archie comics, I read the Dennis the Menace comics, I, you know, um, and it was just something that stuck with me. And it was, it was just something that, that, that I found I was able to speak through. You know? Right. And these were comics um, that your mother brought you, right? To you and your brothers kind of as a way to keep you guys occupied, get her, get you guys out of her hair? Yeah, yeah. She uh, And she was a comics fan as a kid, but she had to hide her comics, you know, because comics are trash, and, you know, mm. they're going to ruin kids' minds, that kind of thing. And, uh, but she encouraged us <laughs> You know, it was better than putting this in front of the TV or which she did, but, um, you know, or things like that, just to shut us up. There was five boys in the house, you know, right. and later 
sister. Um, and so it, it was just something that we, uh, they, they said, draw something or read, look at comics right. or something. And I don't think they had any idea how, how uh, attached we became to that, you know. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know. I didn't know I liked drawing, <laughs> you know. And these were Archie comics and Dennis the Menace, is that correct? Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, you could see the influence of that. In, yeah, yeah, they, in the series. They, yeah, they were just uh, comics that uh, I connected to. You know, I also, I grew up with the early Marvel comics, you know, as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the superhero comics, but the Archie comics stuck out because they had good artists at the time. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure they have good artists now, but um, at the time there were certain artists that just spoke to me that, that, that were really good at characterization, real good at uh, 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 making the characters come alive, I guess, mm -hmm. with just a few lines on paper, <laughs> you know, and uh, I really took to that, especially the older I got right before Love and Rockets when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to do comics, but I, I had nowhere to take them. But um, I was really going back to those old Archie and Dennis the Menace comics because they they had a certain charm that that and way of telling stories that uh, I was very attracted to. And uh, and so I put a lot of that in in how I tell a story, how I how I uh, put the words and pictures together. Right. You know. Right. And I think um, and again, we'll get into this a little bit more often, but I remember uh, one of the things you know, that struck me about Love and Rock is when I first started reading way, way back uh, 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 in the late 80s, early 90s, was um, the, the thickness and the, and the thinness of the lines, um, the way uh, the, the characters were drawn, and particularly, you know, like Maggie and Hopi. And uh, the reason I bring up Archie Comics is because for a while I remember looking at going, boy, this, what does this remind me of? And I couldn't quite put my, my finger on it. Oh, it's Betty and Veronica. Yeah. They were basically my better Veronica. Yes. You know. It's like, you know, they have like this certain va va voom aspect to them, but yet at the same time, um, they're, they're, well, I should say more than Betty and Veronica, they're fleshed out. You know, they, they're... yeah, right. Yeah. And, and that came from um, having friends growing up and, and uh, hanging out with uh, women, you know, mm -hmm. the older I was getting when I got into punk. Uh, you know, I made friends with a lot of punk women who were very funny and spirited. And I, that's what I put. That's why I did Maggie and Hopi. I, I loved the camaraderie. It was like Betty and Veronica in real life, you know. Right. And uh, yeah. And where so, Jughead was sort of, a, you know, a sexual harasser. You know, <laughs> was he? Well, I'm saying in this, in this universe, I mean, you know, it's like, it's like, it, you know, it, it's, it's you know it it, it is sort of uh, uh, that world where also though uh, men behave terribly, um, you know towards them they, they say really sure. horrible things they're they're sexist if not misogynist sure. you sure. know so it's like it introduces that element of like sure. yes you know unfortunately um, you know uh, uh, that's reality that is part of what you would you know these characters would have to deal with yeah yeah I try I tried to bring as much truth to it as I could. You know, I, I, and uh, not, not a lot of it was pretty, <laughs> you know, so, right. uh, so, you know, I, it's just juggling reality and what I want to draw and what I want to write. And, you know, it's just this, this, this stuff and um, having these influences from all corners of the world, yes. you know, and, um, uh, I mean, I just want to say really quick, as someone's pointing out, I see on the webinar tech, yes, Reggie would have been the harasser. That's absolutely correct. It would yeah. not have been Jughead. Though Jughead would have been a surprise. It would have added some depth and interest. It would have been a twist if that, if that had been the case. Um, I wonder if I no, could tell you. Well, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, uh, Jughead just didn't like women. You know, it's he, all right. He, they oh, no, no, he didn't like girls, you know. Oh. And I never found that a problem, but but people did later like 
what's wrong with Jughead? I go, he just doesn't want to hang out with girls. You know? Who he is. <laughs> um, with that in mind, if, if, if I cue you to uh, read a little bit from Maggie uh, the Mechanic, which is tough because sure. it's a comic, but there's uh, parts of it that are epistolary. So mm -hmm. there it is. And I, I wonder if, 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 you, if you wouldn't mind speaking a little bit. Sure. Um, now, I warn you, um, I don't do this sort of thing. So I'm going to be reading like a book report, you know, that's or fine. A book report in front of the class. And that was never good <laughs> for me. <laughs> but, and also, I'm reading the stuff that's 40 years old. So is that um, strange for you? It's um, looking back at it, it's, it's more like, you know, God, I can't believe they said that. Is that what I thought back then, you know, mm. or whatever? Um, you know, I was 22 and I was still a kid, basically. Mm -hmm. But anyway, here is uh, from the story Mechanics from uh, from the Maggie Mechanic book. And it's, uh, it's about um, Maggie gets, uh, she's writing letters to Hopi because she's off on the other side of the world working. And this is the first part of this uh, is uh, written through uh, her letters. So here we go, mechanics. Bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Hopi, surprise, it's me, I'm still alive. I bet you thought I was dead or kidnapped or something. Well, I'm neither. I'm writing from an old decrepit hotel clear across the globe in Zambodia. It was really weird. Last Friday, when you and Izzy went to Mad Dogs without me, I was sitting there all sentido watching TV when the phone rang. It was Rand Race. He said we had a big, big job somewhere outside of the country and that I had to be at the airport in 15 minutes. Sorry, I didn't leave a note, but I barely had time to even pack. I didn't even have, I, did, I didn't have enough clean underwear, so I borrowed some of your old ones, okay? I'll bet you thought I got so sentida that night that I went out and killed myself, huh? <laughs> I'm so excited because we're we're just stopped here for a night. We really have to get to this Jato. And I don't mean the the fun populated city Jato. I mean the jungle, wild animals, cannibals Jato. It's some big job, government job we're on. I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to tell you about it, especially since you're the you're the most anti-government person I know. You're even anti-anti, ha ha. I'd only be gone for about a week. So if you could please feed Tic Tac and wash the dishes this week and I'll <laughs> do them next week. Oh yeah, and please take up the trash, okay? Thanks a lot. See you in about a week. Love you, Maggie. P.S. I finally seen a real live Zimbodian. They really have skin like olives. They also have the biggest feet in the world. Whew. Say hi to Izzy and Penny for me, and I'll bring you all souvenirs from Jato real soon. Okay, next day. Uh, dear Hopi, today we arrived at the Bube, pronounced Bube, airport just outside Jato. We'll be spending the night in the Juan Panadero Hotel. Ugh, what a dump. <laughs> I can't believe I wrote this. <laughs> before, before we take a chopper into the jungle where we'll be working, there we met this funny guy who was supposed to fill us in on where we were staying and stuff like that, but he didn't know his ass from his shit. He wait, we waited around four hours before we got any instructions. It wasn't so bad waiting because they had this little jukebox in the airport cafe and on it was the theme song to that hillbilly program you like. <clears throat> I played it eight times. Oh yeah, I saw a picture of the damages on the rocket ship we will be fixing, and I have a slight feeling will be more than a week. What a mess. I'll write you in a couple of days. Take care, huh? Love you, Maggie. P.S. This is the Bubenese greeting. Bube, bube, be, bu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that means don't count your chickens before your britches is hatched. Ha <laughs> ha. PSS. In case you haven't noticed, our job is to fix a rocket that crash landed in the jungle years ago. 
day one. Well, here we are. Sorry I've taken so long to write, but we have to go about 90 miles into Chateau to mail a letter and the express here is so slow. But anyway, remember when I told you we were working in the deep jungle? Well, even I didn't know it would be the deep, deep, deep jungle where the local native language is so complex that even the local closest tribes, which are several miles away, can't make it out. I mean, this jungle is so deep that if the rocket we have to fix didn't open some space when it crash landed, we'd all be living in the trees. Our huts are very nice. They're just like the ones in the movies, only they smell like gata. <laughs> I guess I'll just have to get used to the stench here in Lower Polisidor. I mean, this jungle is so deep that next to this big, big, big rocket ship we have a we have to fix that is stuck in this slimy mud is a big, big, old, fat, smelly, old, fat, old black dinosaur. No kidding. It kind of looks like a brontosaurus rex, except it's got a bump on its head. They say it's been sitting there since the big, big bird out of the sky, the rocket ship, crashed into it many years ago. And they both have been sitting there since. It seems the big twisted roots underwater grew up around and tangled it up. So it's there for good. Anyway, <clears throat> we talked to Mr. Escareno and he filled us in on the situation. He said, it's only the engine. He's crazier than the last guy. So before we started work the next morning, we had the rest of the day to look around and get a feel of the place. Well, the men did. They went to check out the dinosaur. Me, I got started on my tan. Huh, some tan. Shall I keep going? No, no, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> um, now, like you're saying before, though, you're reading that you wrote that when you were 22. Like, how does it strike you now? Um, uh, it's different. I mean, I write differently now. I, uh, um, I mean, I still like it. I haven't read this story in ages, mm. but uh, um, it's uh, there's a certain spark that we had when the comic was starting. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just I was really really uh like exuberant and and enthusiastic it's not that i i'm not now but 40 years later you know it's kind of like all right what are the characters up to now what should they do you know i'm a, right, I'm a little right. uh i'm a little more relaxed i guess with my comics um i i was gonna ask you well you know based on, on just what you you read um you could see in that early work the influence from all these different places. It seems like you're almost like informed by all these other sort of like comic books of that era of, you know, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, jungle locales and fantastical right. creatures. And this sort of, it sure. feels, yeah, it seems like you're sort of, you guys are feeling your way through this, like trying to kind of make sense, like, you know, what what is it that I really want to talk about? Yes. Um, when, uh, that was from the second issue of the comic book. Um, when we did the first one, we didn't know there'd be a second one. So like I was saying earlier, it was a real learning experience for me. And I was learning as I was going along with the comic. And I was learning a lot of things about myself and, and uh, my art and my storytelling and, and stuff. Um, so it, it you know, I would say, uh, where are they now? Uh, they're in the jungle because I used to see movies about, you know, having jungle was on adventures. TV. Yeah, yeah, and stuff like that. So all my influences just came from my childhood, watching um, B science fiction movies or, uh, you know, monster movies or, or comedies or, you know, and uh, reading comics and then hanging out with my friends on the street and just, and then being into music, you know. And uh, just kind of like throwing it all together, all this like junk culture, mm. bringing it all together, but but having this feeling that it all belonged, you know. Right. And and uh, so yeah, that that early st the stuff in Maggie the Mechanic, you could see I'm kind of growing, feeling my way into what I want to do, you know. 
So, um, um, we, I was gonna, um, before we talk a little bit more about, uh, about Maggie and Hopi, um, I, I wanna talk about this before I forget. So I know punk, the punk ethos is a big part of the field of love and rockets. Um, and you were in Oxnard. Now, so how did you encounter punk in Oxnard? <laughs> um, well, we we were buying, um, you know, the punk records from England and New mm -hmm. York and, you know, Ramones, Sex Pistols, Clash, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it was so far away. I mean, we never thought we would. We... But, but how did that, now how were you attracted to punk culture? Because I'll tell you something. Um, I'm Mexican American. I grew up in San Diego, and you know one of the things I was always so conflicting about stuff that was white punk was that man that was so white. You know, it's like that. That was like that was like right. it felt like you know that's what the white kids like. You know what I'm saying? So right, there was right. like it was it was it was fraught. Like you you know it's like right. you could like it, but then it's like you know it is. Well, if you're going to be that, then are you saying uh, you know are you an Anglo? You know what are you saying? You know what do you you know? Oh what's yeah. The, yeah. Uh, you know, so anyway, it, you know, but you push through that. I mean, because if you love the art, you know, there's and, and you love it and, it and it speaks to you. So I guess I'm, I'm asking you, so what, what part of it spoke to you that you thought, oh man, um, this is something I, I really want to get into? Was it was it an immediate attraction? Was it something that slowly happened? It was uh, slowly happened because, you know, I was four years old when the Beatles came, mm. you know, over. And the British invasion, and so radio was booming, and the culture and um, you know the cultural revolution started. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I I watched it as through uh, eyes my eyes as a kid. You know, mm -hmm. and but so I grew up on basically white music and say Motown and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, but I um, my brothers and I we really got into rock and roll. You know, like my brothers went through a glam phase, mm -hmm. you know, and right. when punk came, it was like, oh, this is like glam, but different, you know, right. and, um, and so I was a teenager by the time punk came, and I was, you know, bored, <laughs> bored <laughs> in Oxnard, and uh, none of my friends, none of my Mexican friends liked it, like punk, you know, um, they liked Earth, Wind, and Fire. I thought Earth, Wind, and Fire was fine, but right. I liked uh, the Sex Pistols, you know? <laughs> right. Um, uh, and as folks are pointing out in, in the chat, I mean, there were a lot of Latinos in the punk scene. You know, people forget yeah. that Los Lobos were on the Slash label, you know? Yeah, and, yes. And uh, yeah, and when we started going to LA to see bands, you know, first we would go see the, the main bands who had hit right. big records and then but we started to like the bands that opened up for them and they were the local LA mm -hmm. bands. And so we started just uh, going to see the local bands and, you know, whenever someone had gas for the car, you know, we'd drive to LA mm -hmm. and watch and watch these shows and we had favorite bands, but I remember there was, it was very diverse, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of color and like a lot of women were involved and stuff like that and so i i really liked it and i really was like you know oh boy that band's all mexicans <laughs> mm. you know this is cool you know wow and uh, you know sometimes my fr white friends were like why why are you so concerned about that <laughs> <laughs> come on guys i mean i need something for myself too but um so uh yeah and and so uh you know, it was hard. It was hard being a teenager, liking, liking Kiss and stuff like that. When, uh, when uh, my Mexican friends were just like always like making fun of me or whatever. Right. You know? Right. Well, you know? I I, I, I want to bring Anita in real soon, but I want to say just very quickly. I think that's one of the things too. I think about the comics I found um, so intoxicating was the way it presented the complexity of that Mexican American experience, all the the varieties. The ways of being Chicano. There wasn't just one way. You know, there sure. wasn't one way that was more authentic than some other way. You know, that, sure. that, that was it was all it was all the piece. You know, there's cholos right. and there's punks and there's goths and there's this and whatever, man. You know, and, yeah. and it's all yes. the same thing. It's all the same community. 
you know, that there's, it's, it's not just one way of being, you know, who you are, you know, as a Mexican American, you know, and I think, and I found that just, I mean, mind blowing, quite frankly, because it's, you know, sometimes uh, in art, things are presented in a sort of regimented way that this is the way you have to think, this is the way you have to be for it to be real, as opposed to, well, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of ways. You know, you know, like like right. the man said, there's all kinds of homeboys. There's not just one, <laughs> right? And then, and that's why I would have uh, like uh, Speedy, um, mm. the guy Maggie had a crush on, but he was a cholo, you know. And uh, and but since they all grew up in the same neighborhood, it was kind of like, oh, Maggie, that stuff you like is crazy. The way you dress is crazy, man. You know, but it wasn't like insulting, you know, because no. they were all they all grew up together. Yeah, you know. All right. Stuff. So let so. me go ahead. And, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, I mean, cut you off. Let me, let me go ahead before uh, I forget to bring on Anita. Anita uh, Felicelli. She's the editor of Alta's California Book Club. She's also the author of Comerica, a, a novel, and the award-winning short story collection Love Songs for Lost Continent. She's been a regular contributor to the San Francisco Chronicle, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and her nonfiction has appeared in the Washington Post and the New York Times, among other places. She is on the board of the National Book Critics Circle, where she serves as fiction chair for 2022-2023. Please welcome Anita Felicelli. Thank you, Oscar. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That was a nice introduction. Jaime, I'm so excited that you joined us. I have really enjoyed getting back to Love and Rockets. Um, I'm a longtime fan, as you know. I've been reading it since uh, 2001, and it was actually one of the comics was the one that I was reading when I met my husband. So it has a special place for me for that reason as well. Oh. <laughs> um, so I love I love these characters. I love the locus in general, and I think you know what I wanted to talk to you about was time because it's pretty incredible to spin out these stories over 40 years. Like I, it's just such a feat. Um, and it's a little bit like a soap opera. There's twists and turns in the plot. There's twists and turns in the love stories. Uh, but there's also this kind of rich emotional resonance in terms of, you know, there's nostalgia. As, as you go along, you sort of jettison some of these science fiction elements, which are really exciting. And, you know, Maggie, the mechanic, but they start to sort of go away to the side. And I wondered, you know, as I, as I was revisiting Maggie and sort of thinking about, you know, other other books that you've written, whether, you know, Maggie and Hopi were always sort of end game for you or whether you were kind of experiencing their adventures along with them as opposed to sort of like pre-designing it. Right. Um, I, the, um, I don't know how to say this. Um, the, I made the characters age. I mean, they, and supposedly in real time even if comics move slower than real life. But um, so I wanted to watch them grow up with me. You know, I wanted to grow up next to them. I, I wanted to uh, see what would happen, you know, with them. I don't know if this answers your question, but um, it's just, uh, I just wanted to, this, to do this for the long run, you know, uh, as long as I could, you know, till my health uh, or, or whatever, or my ideas run out, you know. Um, so, but um, a little bit, a little bit of it was difficult because I didn't know, say, like a character like Hopi, what, how they would grow up, you know, how they would, what they would be like in their 40, 30s or 40s, and uh, and that was because I knew all these punk kids, and then, and then uh, when the comic took off. Um, our punk life kind of slowed down and I don't know what happened to a lot of these people they disappeared and uh or with to them I disappeared <laughs> you know and uh so I had I could I I knew Maggie more you know I knew that she was uh who she is more she's a lot like me and um but someone like Hopi I was like what what does a punk kid do after after causing trouble and getting drunk and hot <laughs> excuse me and um and then uh, my punk friends started to come back you know they were all older and uh and i was like oh so that's what <laughs> that's what they do <laughs> anyway like i said i don't know if that answers your question but <laughs> 
Yeah, no, it absolutely does. Um, I think that is actually something that a lot of critics hit upon in your work, where they're looking at the fact that the women age so realistically, and there's wrinkles and cellulite and weight gain, and you're just really embodying um, the aging process in your work. Like time is a big theme of the work. And then there's also the way that it's unspooling. And there's also just watching these characters get older. You know, I wondered a little bit about like, what was that decision like? Cause you know, in Maggie the Mechanic, which was our featured book, she's very young. It's it, you definitely see like the Dennis the Menace, Archie comics, like Betty Veronica sort of influences in how these women are drawn. But as you get, go along and you have like the love bunglers or um, is this how you see me or something like that, where, um, you know, there's so much attention paid, paid to aging and doing it very realistically and sort of the disappointments and their regrets and sort of show up in the body as well, to some extent. Um, you know, what was the, what was your thought process on that? When did you find, you know, at what point did you start thinking about, oh, I want to make them age, unlike the comics that I grew up with? I think, I think it's, it started because, um, Part of it was um, that that I started to think about their past, like when they were kids, and then so I thought, oh, if they have a past, that's pretty cool. You get to know another side of them. If um, you know, and so maybe I can make them age, and the stuff like uh, Maggie the Mechanic is their past now, you know, and. Uh, I, I just I always liked um, stories told by my uh, mother and my my aunts and and they would tell stories about being growing up, you know. Especially my mom, she would tell, just go on for hours just talking about how cool it was to be barefoot poor in Texas. And I always was that stuff was always warm to me, and so so when Maggie and Hopi started to move on and I started to to want to follow them in a more realistic world, you know, so the the rockets and the robots and stuff started to uh, to fade away because I was more interested in them looking for an apartment, <laughs> you know, or something. And, and then thinking like, uh, you know, um, okay, how old are they now? Okay, they should be thinking about school or they should be thinking about, you know, getting a job for the rest of their life or, or settling down or not settling down or stuff. And I would just think about that. And it was kind of like, they were kind of growing next to me, like whatever I was going through, I would always say, okay, what are the girls up to today? You know, and, uh, and that kind of created this, this past and this almost this future for them and that uh and it was it got me really excited to to find out what was go going on and i think that's part of the reason i i can still do it after 40 years is because i'm still trying to i still want to see what happens <laughs> to them you know yeah, absolutely. So there's no like end game in your mind. You don't, you're not quite sure where it's going to go or do you have like secretly some, <laughs> some idea of, of what well, the uh, is, or... You know, being, being 63 years old now, you know, when I was 22, <laughs> um, starting this stuff, um, you know, I do think of an ending now and some of it's not so great, <laughs> but um, I do think like how many years do we have left, you know, to do this? And I didn't used to think that, you know, when I was younger, it was just like, blam, let's go as long as we can. Um, but I still, I still like them. I still like writing them. I, I like uh, they're in their fifties um, now, you know, um, and some of them have grown up and some of them haven't grown up, you know, and uh, it's, it's kind of like, I'm just, I'm like w watching them live you know it's it's like i'm only reporting what they're up to you know i someone once told me uh they said my uh my comic creator friends they're always talking about these plans of what their next comic is going to be and what their next project is going to be 
and then they told me they go but you seem to talk about your stuff like like you're just the reporter you know like it's already happened i'm just putting down the facts and that's kind of the way i look at it you know and that's what's kept me going this long you know. Yeah, no, it's incredible. I mean, I, I often wonder, like when I'm looking at the at the different panels, like do you, how much time do you have to spend in terms of figuring out, you know, what moments you're actually going to show? Like, is it actually unspooling in your head like a like a movie or is it more, um, you know, yeah. this what looks on the page and then you're like, oh, let me tweak this. Um, it's um, it's uh, I picture it moving like in real life, you know, or a movie, you know, um, it only comes out it lines on paper because it is paper, you know. <laughs> um, but um, everything I'm thinking about when I'm writing it, I'm picturing them moving and actually living and and breathing. Um, so it's, uh, I don't know, it's it's just, uh, it helps me a lot. To, to, it helps me a lot to believe in them, to believe that they're real, you know. I treat them like they're real, I know people think I'm crazy but <laughs> you know um but I have to in or in order to make them breathe you know make them seem more th more uh than lines on paper yeah absolutely do you keep a sketchbook and jot things down as you go or uh, like have I, a lot of time? I jot I jot things down but most of the time it's in my head and uh, a lot of stuff disappears you know um and I go, wow, I had a great idea for a story. Now I don't remember <laughs> what it was. But what, what makes it cool is that it's like, okay, I'm not worried about the story. I'm worried about what's Maggie doing? She seems yeah. really bummed out lately. She's, she's kind of in a funk. Hmm, do I get her out of the funk or do I, or do I uh, investigate her funk? You know, and... Um, and that usually, uh, that's what usually tells the story. Mag Maggie writes the book herself, you know. I didn't, I never planned to have so much Maggie in this comic, but she'll take, she'll take a story and turn, a two-page story and turn it into a hundred-page story. She's just that character. And uh, I'm not going to sit around and wait to find out why, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm just going to let it happen. Yeah, and you and you drew for us a cartoon why I draw, and it was it was uh, Maggie and all these different um, yeah. moments of her life. It was pretty amazing. I thought um, it was very beautiful. I was moved by it. Um, let's see. Oh, I had one more thing before we, and um, then we should probably pull Oscar back. I wondered, um, you know, without. How did you move from Rand Race, who's sort of the main love interest in Maggie the Mechanic, to this love triangle with Poppy and, sorry to give spoilers, everybody, um, <laughs> to move to this love triangle with Ray and Maggie, which I think is so, you know, it's really complex and it actually plays out. That's what ends up playing out over years, more so mm -hmm. than, you know, Rand Race, who's kind of like a dashing, super, you know, he looks like a superhero somewhat, yeah. you know, Clark yeah. Kent or something. And um, the reason I kind of stopped doing race was because uh, um, I couldn't picture where he lived. I couldn't picture him living in a house, having breakfast. I could not picture it. Maggie, oh, sure, I could picture that. I could picture Hopi doing it. I could picture Ray doing it, you know, but if there's a character that I cannot picture them being normal when the no cameras are around <laughs> you know um they usually die out you know and uh the but i don't forget their memories because every once in a while maggie will think about wow race he was he was <laughs> he was the cat's pajamas you know but um yeah yeah i just he was never real to me and so he got left behind basically the comic took off and i couldn't wait for him to fix himself you know see i'm acting like someone else did it <laughs> but that's how I, I i see it you know um so yeah if and if a character uh, disappears 
or at least for a while, it's because um, I just ran out of stuff for them. They've stopped living kind of in my head until like five years later, I'll go, oh, I, I know what I can do. I'll bring them back, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, and it's almost a point of humor because like you have in How to Kill a, you have um, Izzy's like writer's block, you know, but she's also the one, I, I think she's the one that doesn't doesn't actually age as much as the others, right? Like she's almost, she's interacting in one of the comics as like a, with other superheroes from Maggie's comic collection. Is that right? And oh, right. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and she's kind of immortal, like a superhero. And you've got this kind of play with like the immortality versus the mortality and the mortality has really taken over. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it's strange. My my characters speak to me differently. You know, I uh, I I uh, some of them I can't figure out. So I kind of put them on a different plane. You know, and so I play with that. Like like it's kind of uh, you know, um, Izzy's weird. Oh boy, I get to you know mess with this. You know, she can do a lot more than Maggie can. You know. Maggie has to be grounded in her uh, continuity, you know. Uh, someone like Izzy or Penny Century or or somebody, they can go off and do a lot more. So uh, that's Penny Century. <laughs> okay, here's Oscar. So I'll oh hear. yeah, no, you're fine. You're good. I just um, uh, this is the part where we uh, I, I, uh, relate to you some questions from the audience, Jaime. Okay. Um, you are, you know, uh, uh, of course, a comic book artist. Uh, meaning uh, to a lot of people here tonight, there's a lot of questions about the, your about your very art, the art itself. Um, so I want to address those. One of them is simply, did you and your brothers have any formal training? Uh, mostly no. I mean, I took art classes, you know, high school, uh, junior college. Right. You know, just because I didn't want to take algebra, you know. Uh, <laughs> so... And look, no, it, I'm it, sorry. you could have used I, I, algebra this whole time, Jaime. Huh? You could <laughs> Yeah. But uh, you left that on the yeah. table. So, you know, I mean that the art classes helped me a lot, you know. Um, but it was most mostly just from drawing our whole lives, you know, and yeah. and uh, and kind of just doing what we thought was right, you know. Um and also, what are your go-to illustration tools? Pen of choice, ink of choice, paper, this sort of thing? Oh, I just use a standard uh, ink, Super Black India ink. But I use, I don't use a brush. I've never used a brush. Um, I use uh, these pens, uh, nibs, um, you know, dip it and, right. and go to town. And I have three because... One is new and very, inks very thin. And then the next one is uh, in kind of new, but more flexible because mm -hmm. it's aged. And then I have a really old one that can make really broad strokes. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's, how, that's, that's how my art has evolved over the years. But um, in the beginning, I would just use one pen for the whole thing. Wow. you know yeah that, that's incredible um also a couple of questions uh still about oxnard um which and why not let's talk about oxnard first of all uh, how did growing up in an agricultural town influence your writing did you have a awareness of environmental racism and you said oxnard was a great place to grow up and uh what what exactly made it great and i don't think that's not meant sarcastically but truly like and sincerely what, right what was great about oxnard well, being well, what I'm talking about is is being six years old and mm -hmm. leaving the house and just finding adventure in your neighborhood. You know, my my whole world was like two blocks long. You know, um, but it was home and it was just magical to me. You know, it was just like you know there were a million kids on the street. <laughs> you know, you could always find someone to hang out with. Um, <clears throat> And so as for a kid, it was great. There was just, it was very innocent, you know, it was just like, like when those are days when you could, when you walked home from school in kindergarten. Right, you right, know, right, right. You know, um, so 
luckily nothing ever happened, but I just thought that's the way life was, you know, you just, you just live and stuff like that. So that's the way I talk about Oxnard. I don't know anything about the politics of Oxnard. I don't know anything about, about um, who, who you're not supposed to hang out with or, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you know, but, you know, it wasn't till like uh, I got older high school where, where the racism was there, you know, um, and uh, so I, I would say it's like most kids growing up, you know, just, you just dealt with um, what came at you, you know, and you just survived. It was just survival, you know. What you, what you say about bringing about, about the racism is interesting because um, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you was about what the comic scene was like in 1981 when that first uh, issue comes out, because, you know, we're talking about, you know, uh, Reagan's America. Um, we're also going to talk about, you know, what's going to become Pete Wilson's California. And these weren't, <laughs> these were not accommodating times. Right. Um, I was, I was small town, so I didn't care. Yeah. You know, about but that what, part. I, but what was, I, but, but what else was out there besides, like, you know, what were you reading in the so-called alternative scene? Like in 81, when your know, Loving Rockets is coming out. Oh, well, there wasn't an alternative scene. <laughs> or you, a, in you, you, you and your brothers more or less created it. Uh, I would like to say we helped it. You helped it, okay. Yeah, because there were a lot of cartoonists we met who were waiting to bust out but had nowhere to go. We were just dumb enough to just go, <laughs> just to get it out there, you know. And uh, uh, so, but there was not an alternative market, what you call it, you know, that's not the big two, the big superhero companies. You know, so it was like you were Marvel in DC or, or nobody, you know. Wow. And, but we were so small town that we were, didn't care. I didn't care about getting rich. I just wanted to draw comics, you mm -hmm. know. And, uh, and luckily I kept that in my head because it would have ruined me and I would have quit if I would have known how things really were, you know. Mm -hmm. um, when did you find out how things really were? Oh, uh, when uh, when uh, he, I already had my thing, you know, I already mm -hmm. the comic had already supported me um, living a life, you know, because in the beginning, you know, we had no money, you know, we were bums, right. you know, um, and uh, you know, and then the older I got, yeah, the politics came in of of uh, you know where I lived or whatever, um, but. Uh, I always kept my comic separate. I always was able to have my comic that was mine and no one could uh, mess with, you know. So right. that that kind of helped me survive um, where the world was just terrible, <laughs> you know, um, and stuff. I just always had my comic where I could, uh, you know, if I, if I was going through a personal problem, you know, a breakup or, a, you right. know, or this and that, I always had my comic we could, and yeah, I'm just saying, um, I don't know if that was the smart way to do it, but it kept me going and that's why I can still do it in 40 years. But as I hear you talking about that now, it makes more, you know, the dovetailing between what you were doing with your comics and the punk scene makes so much more sense. Um, it's that sense of exasperation, you know, of like, you know, there's gotta be something more to the way we're living, there's got to be something more out there, and there's no obvious channel to express that. So it's like right. it's the, you know DIY. Yeah, and so it was kind of like it was kind of like okay, I don't like uh, what's going on in comics now because because mm -hmm. I'm bored. I, I you know, so we did it ourselves. Basically, just said, well, I'm we're going to make this comic because we're not happy with with. Uh, what we're seeing out there in comics you know i was gonna ask you one more question from the audience and i'll loop anita back in here um it's really interesting uh lisa asks who is or was your most critical reader since the beginning of love and rockets critical someone i, I, I imagine what they mean is someone who you would show things to to for their opinion before like oh. you know, what do you think of this uh probably my brother gilbert because we work together you know uh 
and we talked a lot. We were very close, you know, and we we always talked about like we were it was us two against the world kind of thing, you know. Nice. Um, um, now I I will do it, you know. I'll show my girlfriend, or you know, or you know, right. uh, I would show my wife in the past, uh, or you know, and I would just go. Yeah, I'm doing this thing. But you know, the way I describe it, it's like, yeah, I hope he's pissed off right now. And they just go, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> you, know, you know, just stuff like that, you know. But um, but yeah, um I didn't really I hate to say it, but I didn't really trust a lot of people. Because if you didn't do this comic, then why should I listen to you? Ooh, that one's gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> Well, presumably you have a vision, and and the, and this yeah. thing is is still even after all these years, like you know, a, I don't want to say delicate necessarily, but uh, uh, something with a with a with a with a sense with an integrity that you may be protective about, or even protective that you know how do I fully you do what you do because that's how you articulate to yourself what it is you're trying to do. So until you you see it on the page, okay, that's what I was trying to do, and that could be very difficult. I imagine something you know, to ask for feedback on when you're still not entirely clear. Sure, sure. And a lot of times I surprise myself. You know, I'm still I still will do the comic, and in the middle of writing a scene that I go, eh, this scene is okay, it'll pass, and then I go, no, 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 I'll make this other person say it. And that'll just open up the story like a floodgate, you know. It'll do. It'll do that. And and so I'm constantly su surprising myself still, and I I allow it to happen. But it's it's five guys in my head, not outsiders. <laughs> right, 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 right. So who needs more uh, uh, opinions in that case? You're already, you're only contending <laughs> with the five. <laughs> right. I'm always right. arguing. I always got an argument going up there. Anita, would you would you like to come back on? Hello again. Hi again. I see we have a uh, question in the chat uh, for Jaime. Uh, will you ever say what happened to Maggie's ankle? <laughs> so before I forget, uh, um, I think I've, I've been thinking about it for what thirty years or so, and. <laughs> and uh, um yeah. you'll know when i know <laughs> i still don't have a, a story for that and it's it one day it'll come because i've had un unanswered questions since since uh you know the beginning and some of them are in this book that i always ask myself what happened there what why this person this person mentioned it but what happened and i'll it'll just swim in my head for like years and years till i come out with something the ankle one is really hard because, because I've become a more strict self-editor mm -hmm. with myself that I leave a lot of stones unturned. Um, or I or I uh, my stones are turned. You know, it's it's hard to have to find little loopholes where uh, where I can find where, oh, this could have happened here. But now, now I work so, so the editing of my comic is so tight that I don't leave any um, I don't leave a lot to uh, play with, you know, like like say in the Maggie Mechanic book, Maggie the Mechanic book, there's a lot here that I would just say, oh, Maggie did this. Okay, cool. And then mm -hmm. I'll go, okay, what'd you do? I left it open, you know, because I didn't I didn't really have uh, an idea, so I just have to leave get a little looser with the the facts so I could fit things in if I need to later. You know, well, that sounds great. I think is this our hour now? Are we now at at at, at the hour, Anita? We are at the hour. Um, can I sneak in one last question? Mm -hmm. Please, please. I see that in our audience is Michelle Gonzalez, who wrote a really uh, beautiful essay about um, discovering Maggie for the first time for us um, writing this essay. And I was curious whether you had any memories of a particular punk show or punk group 
that influenced something in, in those early years of Maggie the Mechanic? Um, I would say that whole LA punk scene, you know, all the bands, uh, the X, the Go-Go's, Weirdos, Germs, um, all the bands that were playing LA. Um, uh, the, it, it was just a, it was just a really cool time for me, and and it helped me uh, kind of say, oh, good, now I'm going to do what I want to do, you know, the DIY thing, basically. Um, so, uh, yeah, my favorite bands. I remember uh, even the Go Go's were a punk band in those days, <laughs> you know, um, and. Uh, yeah, I, I really liked uh, bands like X. They were really special. Um, you know, it just, uh, it was just, it was all fun, you know, and, and I look back and I don't regret, you know, any of it, so. <laughs> it's really nice that we have this artwork for you to commemorate the, all of that, so. so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And, oh, and one more thing to this one pointed out um, uh, for folks who are interested, there's the uh, is it CCET. They did a documentary. Uh, yeah, yeah. This uh, in 2022. Um, yeah. Um, I was scared because I didn't know if I had anything to say, but it turned out really well. And I, I really enjoy it. And I think if people are interested, they should watch it. And definitely check that out for uh, for more about uh, the history of Love and Rockets, about Gilbert and and Hayden and Mario and and and, and their whole um, endeavors. Well, I think uh, uh, I I think that's is that it? Yeah, I think so. I'm waiting for my cue because I you know I don't know. <laughs> I will provide your cue. Okay. Pardon pardon the barking dog in the background. It's that time of the night. So. Um, but I will I I'm I will take us out if um, if that's good with everybody else and and um, you can you you got, you're welcome to stick around or you can mute and and um, stop video and I'll do the I'll do the outro. So um, big thanks to Jaime, Oscar, and Anita. Um, that was a fascinating conversation. Um, the video, if you want to revisit it, the interview was recorded and will be up at CaliforniaBookClub.com. Uh, next month's California Book Club book is the novel Less by Andrew Sean Greer, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, the book was. Um, and I just want to remind you all again of the sale on Alta membership for CBC members at altaonline.com slash join, or again, the $3 digital membership. Uh, there will be a two, minutes, a two minute survey that'll pop up as soon as we end the event. So please participate in that. Um, and uh, stay safe, um, stay healthy, see everybody next week, and have a great night and a good weekend. Thanks for being here.